Well, hello and uh, welcome back to uh, to the second video on this uh, on this review of uh, Hegel's text, Who Thinks Abstractly. In the first video, we talked about uh, what is German idealism, which is you know the movement in which this text uh, in which this text um, finds its background and its uh, and its context. And we basically explained that you know a philosopher is someone who is supposed to be thinking concretely, uh, as opposed to someone who thinks abstractly. And um, uh, towards the end of uh, of the last video, um, you know, was I, I thought about maybe people would ask me if there is a difference between concrete thinking and critical thinking and this is precisely what this video is going to be um, going to be about uh, and once you know we explain what is meant by critical thinking uh, in the next video so in the third video we will finally get to uh, to uh, to reviewing the actual text by Hegel now when it comes to th critical thinking you know it's it's a word that you uh, that you hear uh, that you hear a lot you know it has a, it gets a lot of lip service uh, today um, now what you have to know is that ph philosophy itself is critical thinking in the sense that it is thinking in order to answer the question of being with a capital B as Heidegger uh, says uh, as Heidegger says um, philosophy is basically an attempt to unveil being because being is always hidden uh, from us when we uh, when we think we try to uh, to reach out the truth about being well basically we're doing philosophy and that is what critical thinking um, critical thinking is in this sense at least so being hides from us in different ways but mostly it's because of our opinions uh, we have inaccurate opinions about being and those inaccuracies uh, have consequences like being critical in the sense means that you want to see what your opinions are veiling from you uh, and so heidegger explains this in his uh, in his lectures uh, uh, compiled in a book called basic concepts in ancient uh, philosophy he goes to the etymology of the word critic, uh, which comes from the Greek word uh, krinein. Quote, krinein means to separate, to uh, differentiate, in differentiating something from something to make visible both what has been differentiated and what differentiates it. So to see and to grasp being in beings, to differentiate uh, being from beings, is the task of the dif differentiating science, which is philosophy. Its, themes is, its theme is being and never beings. So in short, criticism is the art of making visible the things that were hiding uh, from us, you know, that were hidden from us. So for Heidegger, it's a method to be used in the quest for being with a capital B, but critical thinking can have broader implications than, uh, than just, you know, than just looking for being. Um, you know, it can have other implications uh, or um, it can, can, be, can be used in other domains like education, culture, politics, etc. So criticism is about finding new ways of thinking that would allow us to see or notice things we didn't notice before. And that requires some, uh, you know, some sort of mentality, let's say, some sort of mental state to have, uh, some attitudes about the world. Um, we can say, you know, that the German idealists were pioneers in critical thinking since they were aiming at reforming education. Um, education was mainly about an, an authority that tells you um, what you have to know and you just memorize it and that's it. Um, it didn't involve questioning what we were you know, learning, having some freedom of thought, uh, inventing new methodology for arriving at knowledge, etc. And this was due to the importance that theology was playing in education back then, back during the time of the German idealist. Uh, receiving a religious education was very important in Germany back, uh, back then. And so the German idealists, they wanted to break free from uh, from that to have a sense of autonomy when it comes to uh, when it comes to learning um, unfortunately they found themselves in front of people who resisted freedom because they were you know conditioned since their childhood uh, to always you know rely on authorities for uh, for knowledge so the idealists were um, appealing to the courage of people to dare to separate themselves from their tutors to learn new things on their own 
Um, this is also, you know, the idea of the Enlightenment, uh, whose, uh, um, whose spirit was captured by that famous phrase by Emmanuel Kant, sapere ode, which means dare to know. Um, that's from his famous essay, you know, what is Enlightenment, in which he wrote, Enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred uh, tutelage. Tutelage is man, uh, man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. Self-incurred is this tutelage when its, uh, when its cause lies not in lack of reason, but in lack of resolution and courage to use it without direction from another. Sapere ode, have courage to use your own reason, that is the motto of enlightenment. So knowledge is supposed to be that thrust into, well, you know, what, what Kant calls critique. Uh, critical thought for Kant is basically self-knowledge in the sense of knowing what, uh, what can be known from what cannot be known. Uh, what Kant was doing at that time was pointing out that the authority figures in charge of our education were misleading us for basically two reasons. Uh, one, they were talking about, you know, transcendent knowledge, uh, knowledge beyond experience, and thus it cannot be known, like knowing God, knowing his properties, for example, these things cannot be grasped. So we're uh, being forced to know things that cannot be known, and if we can, uh, and if we say anything, sorry, if we say anything, uh, uh, to, to contest this, to challenge this, well, you will get punished. And secondly, not only they speak of things beyond experience, but even when things are within the reach of experience, these figures of authority, they dismiss experience altogether, thinking that rationalism would suffice. Um, here, um, here too, this means also two things. It means that the educator, mostly uh, theologians, are dismissing experience in the scientific sense, uh, like they uh, like they pay little attention attention to experimentation to uh, verify their knowledge um, and the other meaning is more general if I memorize I won't forget that knowledge I don't have to experience it uh, in my daily life for example mathematical equations can be learned just by doing some solitary exercises I don't need to relate to mathematics when I socialize with my friends um, knowledge of course doesn't work like that you know um, like for Kant, uh, our knowledge needs to be experienced in order to be uh, to be learned. It needs to have an observable impact on the world, on our entourage, so that it becomes meaningful to uh, to us. You know, so that's what uh, Kant means by you know by by experience by experiencing your knowledge here, right? Um, so critical. Critical thought can be summed up as not taking things for granted. You need to verify your knowledge to be sure that you are uh, getting the right kind of knowledge and to be able to apply that uh, knowledge to our everyday life. And of course, that would mean that you become independent from uh, from the authority figures who were, you know, giving you uh, that knowledge in the first place. Okay, so you, you need to be autonomous in in the sense of you have to think about. Uh, that that knowledge that you are receiving throughout all of your education. So, um, education through uh, so, sorry educators throughout uh, the world um, soon beca became uh, advocates for critical thinking. Um, I can recommend uh, I can recommend David uh, David Hitchcock's entry of critical thinking in uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy, um, which by the way, I mean, it's a very great encyclopedia. Uh, it was um, it was created by this guy, uh, Edward uh, Zalta, um, and it is, you know, free, it is online, you can go and find all kinds of <laughs> entries in, uh, in, uh, in there uh, about all kinds of subjects in uh, in philosophy. So uh, there is an entry called Critical Thinking in that uh, encyclopedia. It is by a guy named uh, David uh, Hitchcock, and he traces the this the beginning of you know critical thinking as we understand it today um, with the famous. Uh, pragmatic philosopher John Dewey, who wrote ex ex uh, extensively on how we think in a critical uh, in a critical manner. Now, he didn't use the term critical thinking, uh, he used reflective thinking, saying that, you know, uh, reflective thinking is active, persistent, and careful consideration of any belief or supposed form of knowledge in the light of the grounds that support it, and the further conclusions to which it tends uh, constitutes reflective thought. 
So this, that's from his famous book, How We Think. Uh, and Dewey, I mean, he explains, you know, what he means, what he means by this. It's basically uh, thinking in a scientific, uh, in a scientific manner, um, in the sense of making sure that our thoughts, in some kind of, uh, in some kind of. Uh, is, is like some, some kind of chain with each link follows logically the one before it like your thoughts cannot be random you know but you must be sure that whenever whatever thought you have now is linked to another one that precedes it and each idea must not just follow another uh, idea randomly but logically your ideas must be you know the consequence of precedent idea Quote, reflection involves not simply a sequence of ideas, but a consequence, a, uh, uh, but a, con uh, but a consequence, a uh, cons consecutive ordering in which, uh, in such a way that each determines the next as its uh, proper outcome, while each in turn leans back on its predecessors. So here, critical uh, critical thought become equivalent to putting our knowledge to the test. Uh, this is about you know analyzing our opinions about the world and uh, and others. Um, and as the world keep unfolding through time, uh, the demand for critical thought only increased. Um, after the two world wars, for example, many theorists blamed uh, the wars on a lack of critical thinking from you know from from people uh, critical thinking would have made uh, people see you know the xenophobia or racism that was fueling the war efforts uh, people would be more rational and learn to differentiate between science and pseudoscience often used as a weapon to justify uh, dangerous ideologies and so theorists of critical thinking saw in it the the possibility to counter uh, non-democratic ideas and uh, non-democratic speeches by training people to see flaws in those speeches. You know, what they were advocating for uh, can be summed up by uh, the 12 components of critical thinking, uh, again by Hitchcock uh, in, the same, uh, in the same entry. These components uh, event, um, uh, might include one, noticing a difficulty, two, defining the problem, three, dividing the problem into manageable sub-problems, four, formulating a variety of possible solutions to the problem or sub-problem, five, determining what evidence is relevant for this, to, deci uh, to deciding among possible solutions to the problem or sub-problems, um, six, devising a plan of uh, systemic observation or experiment that will uncover the relevant evidence, carrying out the plan for uh, the plan of systematic observer uh, observation or experimentation eight noting the results of the systematic uh, observation or experiment nine gathering uh, relevant testimony 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 and uh, information from others, 10 judging the credibility of, testimo of testimony and information uh, gathered from others, 11 drawing conclusions from gathered evidence and accepted testimony, and 12 accepting a solution that the evidence uh, uh, adequately supports. So these were basically the components uh, and they were also promoted in movements like what we call the inf what we call the informal logic movements of the of the 1970s, um, which sought you know to make people aware of logical fallacies and biases, you know, and. Um, like for example, what is an appeal to ignorance? Uh, that's a fallacy. It's when you don't know something, and um, and so you conclude that it has to be a specific belief that you hold to explain to explain it. You know that's a fallacy. Okay, so a fallacy. It's like a uh, it's like an argument that sounds logical, but once you ex ex uh, examine it, well, it's not logical at uh, at all. Uh, so commonly an example of an appeal to ignorance would be like, I don't know how the universe began to exist, therefore it must be God, you know. So that of course is a fallacy, it's a logical, it's a logical error, we don't have enough evidence to assert that it must be God just because we still don't know how the universe began to exist. Um, begin to uh, to exist um, others are like the black and white fallacy it's when you claim that there are that there are only two options to a problem when there are many more uh, many more you know options many more nuanced uh, options um, you have the famous straw man uh, 
fallacies when you misrepresent a position to make it easier to dismiss you have the ad hominem fallacy which is when you attack the um, the other's character instead of addressing their argument and so critical thinking is therefore about skills in thought as to make sure that our knowledge is reliable uh, it's not necessarily about you know being right as as much as it is about the method that we use to arrive at our knowledge, okay? We, um, we already have a glimpse of this in our early school days, you know, in math classes, for example. We were always told that, we, um, that what matters isn't, uh, isn't that we got the right, uh, the right answer or the right result, but you had to show your teacher your methodology. How you got to the result uh, matters more than the result itself. Um, and this is what, you know, to, to go back to the German idealists, this is what Schelling um, and the idealists, they had in mind with, uh, when, we're, when they were talking about freedom. The point of showing methodology is to claim that, uh, uh, is, to claim to, uh, is, is to claim to that freedom that we mentioned earlier, you know, uh, this isn't much like, uh, this isn't much like we, we did in schools, uh, as you know, we had to show the method that the teacher showed us in class. You know, I mean, if the teacher demands that you use the method that he showed you uh, and not any other method, uh, and not any, um, uh, and not uh, another, uh, another method, uh, you know, it's then it's not, you know, what the German idealists were, were advocating for, you know. Um, instead, like critical thinking would demand that teachers acknowledge when a student uses a different methodology uh, and a valid methodology, of course, to arrive at a result and to assess them on the method they used, uh, since that is a sign of freedom of judgment, right? So, uh, you, had, you had pedagogues uh, like uh, Harvey, uh, Harvey S Siegel uh, in uh, 1988 uh, who wrote a book called Educating Reason, Rationality, Critical Thinking and Education and in it he has offered four uh, considerations in support of adopting critical thinking as an educational uh, ideal. First, <coughs> sorry, first um, you have respect for persons, uh, which requires that schools and teachers honor students' demands for reasons and explanations, deal with students honestly, and recognize the need to confront students' independent judgment. Uh, these requirements concern the manner in which teachers treat students. Uh, two, education has uh, the task of preparing children to be successful adults, a task that requires development of their self-sufficiency. Three, education should initiate children into the rational traditions in such fields as history, science, and mathematics, and for education should prepare children to become democratic citizens, um, which requires reasoned procedures and critical talents and attitudes. And, um, and later on, in 1990, you had another guy, Peter Fashione, I think that's Fashion, I think that's, uh, that's how it is pronounced. He uh, proposed a long and very um, exhaustive definition of critical thinking in his, book called, in his book called Critical Thinking, in which, you know, he says, uh, we understand critical thinking to be uh, purpose, um, purposeful, self-regulatory -regula judgment which results in interpretation, analysis, evaluation and infer uh, inference, as well as explanation of the evidential, conceptual, methodological, uh, criteriological or contextual considerations upon which that judgment is based. Critical thinking is essential as a tool of inquiry. As such, critical thinking is a liberation force in education and a powerful resource in one's proposal uh, personal sorry personal and civic life while not synonymous with good thinking critical thinking is a pervasive and self reflect uh, rectifying human phenomenon the ideal uh, critical thinker is habitually inquisitive well informed trustful of reason open-minded flexible fair-minded in evaluation honest in facing personal biases prudent in making judgments, willing to reconsider, clear about uh, issues, orderly in complex matters, diligent in seeking relevant information, reasonable in the selection of criteria, focused in inquiry, and persistent in seeking results which are, are, which are as precise as the subject and the circumstances of, uh, inquiry, uh, of inquiry permit. 
Thus, educa uh, educating good critical thinkers means working toward this ideal. It combines developing critical uh, thinking skills with nurturing those disp uh, dispositions which consistently yield useful insights and which are the basis of a rational and democratic society. So critical thinking came to be synonymous with thinking about you know, society and politics. When we have inequalities, for example, sometimes we were told that that's just because you know, the people who are poor, they are just lazy. When a critical thinker would take that opinion and test it, like we look at the reasons behind those inequalities and we see if you know, people are lazy is the best way to explain those inequalities or it is perhaps you know other causes like you know the the redistribution of um, of resources uh, a weak uh, welfare state an unregulated job market or a regulated one but regulated so that it serves the interests of some people to the detriment of uh, of others and so when we have uh, racist or sexist opinions in our heads for example a critical thinker would ask about their origins uh, where are those ideas coming from are they accurate is there a certain social organization that will favor you know those uh, those opinions and make it difficult to foster more accurate ones um, well when, when I said social organization I meant a social uh, structure right not an organization in the sense of you know a company or or um, or, uh, or or something like that okay so um, when people are living uh, in uh, in precarity, for example, and are frustrated all the time, looking for a scapegoat is the usual thing they'll think about, right? So we cannot really take uh, take opinions as accurate, like just uh, just head on, especially if they are uh, if they are xenophobic. So um, so here you can you can talk about Marxism, you can talk about Marxist theory, uh, which became to be known as critical theory because that's what we're setting uh, setting to do. We look for the social structures that foster our biases, and we try to dismantle them for other social you know structures that would foster higher forms of knowledge, more accurate and more aligned with experimentation. Okay, um, take for example. My Max, uh, Max Hork, uh, Horkheimer who was a Marxist from uh, the Frankfurt School of Thought and he wrote in an essay called uh, Traditional and Critical uh, Theory. Uh, it's from, from a, you can find this essay and many others in a collected work of uh, Horkheimer called Critical Theory, Selected Essays, and in it he explained what is critical thinking. He says that critical thinking is motivated today by the effort really to transcend the tension and to abolish the opposition between the individual's pur purposefulness, spontaneity and rationality and those work process relationships on which society is built to strive for a state of affairs in which, they, uh, in which there will be no uh, exploitation or oppression in which all uh, an all embracing subject, namely self-aware mankind, exist and in which it is possible to speak of a unified theoretical creation and a thinking that transcends individuals to strive for all of this is not uh, to strive for all of this is not yet to bring it to pass so so later on you had feminism you had post-colonialists uh, you had critical race theorists uh, theorists queer theorists they all followed this and use critical thinking to address the cultural biases against women immigrants colonized people ethnic minorities and lgbtq minority uh, minorities and communities um, they took most of their work from michel foucault who summarized what uh, critical thinking means during an interview with uh, with a guy named didier uh, eribon um, and basically he uh, he says a critique is not a matter of saying that things are not right as they are it is a matter of pointing out what the kinds of assumptions what kinds of familiar unchallenged and considered modes of thoughts the practices that we accept uh, the practices that we uh, that we accept rest uh, criticism is to show that things are not uh, as self-evident as we uh, as we believed to see uh, that what is accepted as self-evident will no longer be accepted as such Practicing criticism is a matter of making facile, uh, facile gestures difficult. So this critical uh, theory movement brought also another attention uh, that was perhaps lacking in the informal uh, logical movement of the 70s, uh, that the second wave of uh, 
critical thinking mov uh, movement sought to uh, sought to correct. Um, the problem was that the, the movement of the 70s put too much emphasis on logic and rationality, but that too uh, can lead to superfluous thinking if you don't take into consideration other factors of how knowledge creates itself. And so first, as some critics have pointed in the, in the 80s, like for example, uh, John McPeck uh, in his book Critical Thinking and Education, um, when you take thinking to be a subject uh, in and of itself, you can make people see uh, thinking in the same way as they see the, the other subjects, you know, like it is just a subject that I have to learn about exactly like math, physics or history. So in other words, critical thinking itself becomes uncritical. Um, like in other words, critical thinking cannot just be one subject among others, but it is a method to be applied in different subjects. Like you cannot teach critical thinking as a field in itself, but you can teach physics in a critical way or teach people to think critically about physics. So for MacPeck, uh, critical thinking is always about a certain context in which I can think critically. You know, it is subject specific. And he also point that if you teach critical thinking as a field and then expect students to just apply what they learn in their critical thinking class um, to the subject, uh, to the other subjects, that won't work precisely because it is subject specific. This means that each field will have a certain kind of critical thinking appropriate to it, you know, like you cannot have just one class of critical thinking and then you think that whatever you're gonna learn in that class you can apply it to all uh, other subjects because each subject demands that, you know, it has a specific kind of critical thinking that, you know, works, works with it. You cannot have a generalized critical thinking and apply it to all fields. Uh, thinking critically about physics is very different from crit uh, thinking critically about paintings, for example. And likewise, the interests and characters of individuals will also uh, will also vary and those variations will play a role in how they are going to think critically you know someone may be good at critical thinking in one field but sucks in uh, in another um, and so therefore thinking that the problem is just about people having the wrong opinions that we can you know rectify by pointing to logical fallacies isn't going to be enough because um, and this is also another problem of the uh, of the 70s critical uh, that critical thinking uh, faced during the 70s um, opinions are first and foremost emotional things our emotions play uh, as much of a role perhaps even greater in forming our opinions as logic and rationality so the second wave of critical uh, thinking movement. Um, this came during uh, the, 90, the 90s. They sought to bring the uh, emotional aspect in critical thinking. Um, now when you think critically, you have to take into consideration your emotions as well as other people's emotions. There has to be an awareness of the role of empathy, for example, when we deal with racism and sexism. Uh, to get rid of dangerous biases isn't just a matter of showing you the, the studies that debunk brain sizes, for example, because someone who has a dangerous bias doesn't have the truth as a priority, right? If they had, they then they wouldn't have formed this bias in the first place. Hence, other tools need to be added than, you know, than just showing you what the actual science says. So critical thinking also requires dispositions in order to be effective. Um, Robert Ennis uh, is, uh, is another major figure in uh, critical uh, thinking. He put it in his 1996 uh, paper, Critical Thinking Dispositions. Um, he added a group of dispositions to care about the dignity and worth of every person, uh, like an educational program that aims at developing uh, critical thinking, but not the correlative uh, disposition to care about the dignity and worth of every person would be less um, valuable and perhaps harmful. Quote, a criticism of critical thinking for definitional uh, omission of caring for the worth and dignity of every person could well be based on the unreasonable assumption that the concept critical thinking should represent everything that is good and overwhelming requirement indeed. On the other hand, any educational program that includes critical thinking but not the correlative disposition to care about every person's worth and, uh, and dignity would be deficient and perhaps dangerous. The power 
power of critical thinking unaccompanied by this correlative disposition could lead to serious trouble. So the omission of the emotional and affective content of thinking leads someone to being unable to think critically about issues surrounding gender, race, uh, race or even, you know, class struggle. And so as a result, critical thinking would become a tool not to solve those issues, but either to overlook them or even to reinforce them. Uh, in 2001, uh, for example, educator uh, Cal uh, Alston uh, noticed that her students had little problems with identifying gender, uh, gender issues in a class when it is about, you know, addressing myths like, for example, the, the, Cinderella, uh, the Cinderella's myth of romantic love at first sight. Um, like, you know, the, the students had no problem identifying, you know, the problems with that, uh, with that myth. Um, in her paper, Rethinking Critical Thinking, the, sed uh, the, seduction, uh, uh, the Seductions of Everyday Life, she says that her students can see the problematic messages that the Cinderella story sends to women about romantic love, like, for example, um, message uh, feminine passivity is ultimately rewarded suffering makes one deserving or you know kindness is good but it is only effective when uh, inner and outer beauty meet uh, or true love solves the problems of loneliness and insignificance so all of them all of the all of the students they possess the skill to deconstruct these stereotypical stories like that but that doesn't mean that in their everyday life those skills are used instead she argue uh, most of them have romantic relationships like cinderella uh, many of them want love to be something about merit for example many are seeing love as a matter of competition like cinderella and her stepmother are in competition about uh, about looks you know to appeal to men um, so, critical thinking shouldn't be simply an intellectual activity that we do just in class, but it is something that has to be done in our day-to-day -day lives as well. In her own words, uh, people have to be able to connect their intellectual, intellectual critique to a more effective uh, somatic and ethical account of making risky choices that have sexist, racist, classicist, uh, classist, sorry, uh, familial, uh, sexual, or other concepts consequences for themselves and those both uh, both near and far. Critical thinking that reads arguments, texts or practices merely on the surface without connections to feeling, desiring, doing or action lacks an, ethic, uh, an ethical depth that should infuse the difference between mere cognitive activity and something we want to call critical thinking. So this leads us to the problem with critical thinking. Now critical thinking is on everyone's lips. Like I said uh, earlier, everyone is craving for critical thinking and everyone blames the decadence of societies on a lack of critical thinking. Um, like the, when you look at the decadence in education, for example, teachers would tell you that's because students aren't taught to be critical, uh, critical thinkers. And so, like, uh, like Schelling was already pointing out, uh, students are just memorizing things to which they don't see any point. What, what we need is students who think critically about what they are learning. If students learn to be critical thinkers from childhood, you'll see a lot of our political problems will be, will be solved. Or at least this is the, um, the discourse. So politicians also are going to be advocating for critical thinking. Uh, if citizens are critical thinkers, uh, then we will have better democracies, we will have better democratic debates, and policies will be easier to make and to agree upon. Scientists is going to, uh, to be urging. Uh, scientists are going to be urging people to be critical thinkers, to be able to distinguish between the real science, pseudoscience, and ideology. Your boss is also going to be tell you to be. A a critical thinker so that so that you can come up with new and better ways to be efficient at your job to come up with innovations that would save you know the, the collapsing markets or or whatever your life coach is going to be is going to be telling you to be a critical thinker so that you can be better at you know emotional intelligence marketing gurus will tell you to be a critical thinker when you want to sell a product to be innovative in your approach to be more convincing uh, priests rabbis or imams tell tell you to be critical thinkers and approach scriptures with a clear uh, with a clear and critical mind so that you can distinguish between religious wisdom and religious propaganda conspiracy theorists will say that people need to be skeptical and critical thinkers to see the hidden 
truth behind the, the spectacle of elites and the lizard baby uh, eating, uh, eating uh, celebrities. And so, yeah, so you can kind of see the problem is that, well, everyone wants critical thinking. And so soon you start to see where this is, uh, where this is leading. When people um, talk about critical thinking, it's always in opposition to someone who doesn't use critical thinking. When scientist says, uh, be critical in your thinking, like he has in mind someone who is not critical. When Richard Dawkins, for example, tells you to be uh, critical when doing science, he means don't be like Deepak Chopra. And so the problem is Deepak Chopra is going to be saying the same thing about Dawkins. When you are a critical thinking uh, thinker, according to uh, Chopra, well, then you're not Dawkins. And so we find ourselves in a pickle, because when Macron, for example, wants people to be critical thinkers, he means that if you are thinking critically, then you will agree on, uh, on, my, on my reform. Uh, when Jordan Peterson tells you to be a critical thinker, he means don't give in to the gender ideology or the cultural Marxism that is brainwashing your children. Uh, and so you have to be a gender critical if you want to save the mentality of your, of your poor kids. So it seems that, uh, it seems that you know, uh, whenever someone advocates for critical thinking, they advocate for something that happens to always be aligned with their uh, interests and beliefs. How convenient. And so Hitchcock himself uh, pointed uh, a list of some of the problems with critical thinking when it is used to reinforce unjustified biases. He notes the following, uh, the following ways. He says that, you know, uh, critical thinking can reinforce, can be a reinforcement of egocentric and sociocentric biases over dialectical engagements with opposing worldviews. Um, it, can, it can form distancing from the object of inquiry over closeness to it, indifference to the situation of others over, uh, over care for them, um, orientation to thought over orientation to action, being responsible, uh, respons uh, reasonable over caring to understand people's ideas, being neutral and objective over being embodied and situated, doubting over believing, uh, reason over emotion, imagination and intuition, solitary thinking over collaborative, uh, collaborative thinking, uh, written and uh, spoken assignments over other forms of expression, uh, attention to uh, written and uh, spoken communications over attention to human problems, winning debates in uh, the public sphere over making and understanding uh, and, and uh, making and understanding meaning. And so. This, of course, doesn't mean that there is no objective criteria for critical thinking, that who, whoever is claiming it, uh, claiming, uh, claiming it is just a, a hypocrite. If, you're really, if you are really a critical thinker, then of course you'll try to align your interests and beliefs with, uh, with it. I mean, if by, uh, if by thinking critically about society and you find out that there are a lot of unjust inequalities as a result of capitalism, becoming skeptical of free market economy is, well, it's only logical. I mean, yeah, your interests are going to be aligned with that, uh, with that critical thinking. The problem is that how can you know whose interests and beliefs are aligned with actual critical thinking and whose critical thinking is aligned with their beliefs and interests. In other words, you know, who is using critical thinking as a tool to reinforce their own interests and who is using critical thinking to transform their interests. It just seems that when someone, when everyone, sorry, when everyone is pleading for critical thinking, it becomes difficult to determine who is the critical thinker. So when people are wrong now, they can just assume that you are being rigid, you know, that you are the one who is lacking in critical thinking. Uh, because uh, you say, you know, for example, if you say, for example, that the law of attraction is bullshit and it's pseudoscience, despite that there is no serious scientific evidence to support that, you know, there is such a thing as the law of attraction, those who believe in it will blame you for not thinking critically, for being too narrow-minded, for being 
for being two-sided, for example. You can find a lot of religious thinking like that, you know, like atheists nowadays are often accused of being brainwashed, that they don't think critically about their beliefs, that they, uh, that they know nothing about religion, that their hearts and eyes are close to the truth, but if only they allow themselves to think critically about atheism, they will see that atheism is wrong and untainable. And so, and so yeah, and you can also think of people who would claim that criticizing religion like Islam, for example, is Islamophobic because they argue that uh, that uh, that criticism of Islam uh, of Islam is a way to disguise bigotry. You know, when Christopher Hitchens, for example, makes a speech, for example, uh, or publishes a book, Muslims can see not a critical thinker but a threat, a discourse of ideology uh, ready to be utilized for the next invasion. For example, you know, like if I am living in a Muslim country and I have uh, oil, the United States can encourage criticism of Islam to uh, to make it easier for Americans to consent to invasion of Muslim countries. So, who is the critical thinker in this situation? You know, it is is it Hitchin or is it Tariq Ramadan? Both, ne uh, neither, and so that's the main issue that we'll see with Hegel's text. Its title is Who Thinks Abstractly is revealing because we are in a situation in which no one wants to be uh, to be abstra abstract. Everyone wants to be concrete and critical in their thinking and this is what makes it difficult to be a critical thinker because apparently everyone claims to be one and there is no you know there is no uh, official authority that can decide that can decide who is uh, which is who you know so how can we spot abstract thought when everyone agrees that abstract thought is bad you know uh, and so that's what we are going to see next time so now we we'll finally uh, get to hegel's text who thinks abstractly to see what concrete thinking is uh, is like in concrete situations when we apply german idealism to our everyday life so thank you for watching and i will see you next time to start uh, reviewing the actual